Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining what we hope will be an informative session today. Uh, today, we're lucky enough to be joined by Dr. Julian Grenier, who led the revision of the new Development Matters guidance materials, along with his colleague and fellow educator, Rahima Begum, as well as being joined by Wendy Ratcliffe, HMI, who works, whose work in Ofsted is focused on the early years inspection policy, and her colleague, Joy, uh, Jill Jones, HMI, who's Ofsted's Deputy Director for Schools and Early Education Policy. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank them all for their time, as well as um, thanks to the amazing admins of this early adopters group, who despite, despite being full-time educators themselves, run such a great supportive group. Before we start, um, the chat box will be open to you to ask questions, and at the end, we'll do our best to try and answer as many of those as we can, depending on time. Um, thank you to those of you who sent in questions before today. These have been shared with the panel and will hopefully be answered for you during the session. Um, this last year has been a bit of a challenge for all those in education and while some of the, for some, the timing of the new EYFS framework was not seen as ideal, the changes that has been brought, uh, has been brought about from it, especially the reduction in need for producing tracking data for children that always didn't go on to support their development, I think is a welcome change. Uh, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to hand over to Julian now, who's going to talk about the intention behind the early years reforms and develop matters about curriculum, as well as using assessments to check that children are learning what we intend. And instead of tracking and using levels, how to focus, uh, how the focus should be on uh, secure learning. So thank you, Julian. And um, thank you so much. Um, Echo your thanks to Vic and the um, admin team on this Facebook group who do an amazing job. I don't know how they do it, um, but they do in their own time um, to support so many of us. And before I share my screen and the PowerPoint that I've got, um, what an incredible group of people team early years is. And I really want to just thank anyone who watches this, whenever you catch up on this or watch this, just to think about the incredible levels of dedication and support and love that are being given to children in the early years by practitioners such as yourselves at this very important time. So I'm gonna share my screen um, and share some thoughts really uh, about, uh, I guess some of the questions and the themes that are coming up uh, online and from people that I'm working with. I would just like to make it really clear that I am just speaking for myself here. I'm certainly not speaking for Ofsted or the Department for Education. Um, and I hope that the thoughts I've got will be helpful to people who are watching this afternoon. So just to refresh, because we get so busy doing stuff that we quite quickly kind of lose some of the big picture if we're not careful. So a reminder of those key aims of the changes to the EYFS, an increased focus on children's communication, giving all children a better start to their learning and their life in school, improving children's life chances, which has always been critical, but is especially crucial um, at the moment, uh, and reducing workload for practitioners. And as Ben was just saying there, that focus on thinking first about what sort of assessment work will improve learning for children. And if we don't think it will improve children's learning, let's stop doing all of that stuff that can take up so much of our time. So let's just start off with some thoughts about communication um, and uh, what does the evidence say? So the evidence tells us, and you can see this in the Education Endowment Foundation's Preparing for Literacy guidance report, the evidence tells us that communication is the foundation of children's thinking and learning, both in the early years and through schooling. Your vocabulary at five is one of the best predictors of how well you'll do at school, and children with a richer vocabulary find it easier to learn to read. Children who can communicate well can make friends. They can solve conflicts and problems through words. And in fact, an emphasis on improving communication 
together with a key person approach and that strong focus on children's emotional well-being it's a really powerful cornerstone for children's enjoyment of EYFS today but also enjoyment of the rest of their education tomorrow so even though the current development matters is a lot shorter than the predecessor document it's a 90 minute read now it's actually got a longer section on early communication um, and we worked on that with a group of practitioners and also the involvement of the children's communication charity ICAM to get it as right as we could we've also focused in development matters on the reality that we live in multilingual England over 20 percent of our children in EYFS are multilingual and in settings like the one I'm speaking to you from today, Sheringham Nursery School in Newham, the large majority of our children are multilingual. That's a tremendous richness for us, but it can also be um, a new challenge for many of us. So Rahima, uh, unfortunately, isn't able to join us live. Um, she's one of our teachers here, and she's recorded um, a short video just talking through some of the things she's been thinking about as someone working frontline with children day in day out with that focus on communication i'm a teacher working in a nursery class working with children aged three and four the revised eyfs has allowed us to place a greater focus on children's communication and language the first half of this term has been about supporting children successful. Developing warm, caring, attentive relationships has been, has been our priority. This is key if we want to develop children's communication and language. As practitioners, we are now confident to dedicate time to children without the need to do endless evidence collection. We have seen the impact this has had on our children. Children are coming into nursery ready to play and communicate and feeling happy. Once children are happy and settled, we have been focusing on listening to children and having conversations. So now our time is more free, it means we can really be present with the children and share attention. Okay, and just in case the volume was a bit low your end like it was my end, one of the great, great joys being on the early adopter group last year was hearing so many people saying that with the reduction in the focus on unnecessary work, they were able to be more present with the children. Instead of having that focus on collecting evidence, the focus was on being with the children, listening to them, having conversations with them. And we've tried to push that even further this year. Um, and Rahima has done an incredible job to really get her team focused on conversation with children as a top priority. You know, many of the kids that we're working with nearly their whole or even the whole of their life has been in the conditions of lockdowns and the pandemic they've missed so many chances to play and chat together but what's so exciting is to see how the impact of Rahima's work is shining through that those children are feeling so much more confident and settled and happier and communicating really well because she has made that such a big priority for her team. Unfortunately, the research tells us that much of what happens in both nursery and reception is not about that rich language filled environment that Rahima talked about then. And instead, we end up in a situation where the day is dominated by teacher talk, by adults talking in a way that can often be quite directive and unresponsive. Lots of everyone needs to sit here, come over here, snack time now, everyone needs to put their coat on, that sort of very restricted language code. Uh, and that sort of low level conversation is associated with poorer, with restricted and less complex language use by the children. So this has got to be a key focus this has got to be what we take as an opportunity from the changes to EYFS to improve. Because in contrast, the research tells us where children do receive frequent examples of language models, development is enhanced. So we can do it. 
we can make a difference, but it's important that we take advantage of the changes to the EYFS and put that additional focus on children's early communication. Um, you may have seen that there are a set of resources available now from the Department for Education, Help for Early Years Providers. Um, and those resources both cover the different areas of learning uh, and help us to tackle changes to EYFS and also give us some help to improve practice. Now, the focus of these resources is working with children up to the age of four. The focus isn't reception year. But I think that the um, short video, which I'm going to share now, which is about language development, um, is really relevant for the whole of the EYFS sector. And if you are working with that younger age group of children, Help for Early Years Providers, I think, is a, a very useful resource. Language development in the first years of life is critical to later educational success. Language skills are time sensitive, which means that they're really difficult to acquire later on. As practitioners, we're in a position to make a big difference at this crucial stage by providing a rich language environment and by being attentive conversation partners. Language development is best supported in a playful environment full of stories and songs, rhymes, signs, talk and imaginative play. So one of the things we're going to talk about is actually just trying to find time to talk with children in everyday experiences and routines. I'm just wondering whether you've got some examples that we could explore around that. Um, when I was working with the, in the two-year-old room, um, I think one of the things we've been really thinking about and reflecting on is, is ensuring that the routine has a pace but isn't so quick that the children are rushed through it because drawing those daily routines and those everyday activities are a really good opportunity to, for them to explore and talk and us to talk together with them and they're really able to make connections with their home routines. I think it's really important for children to have real reasons to talk and have lots of opportunities for spontaneous conversations, but also perhaps um, more structured times with adults to support their communication and language. Have you got any examples that you use in your setting? When we finish the first bit of the morning, we come back and sit down in small groups, which is we, talk, we call um, review time and the children, they um, talk about what they, what they have been learning in that morning and uh, they share with their uh, peers as well and um, you know, they ask what they've been and what they like and what they were doing and who were they playing, which is very important for children who doesn't want to talk that lot, you know, and they share experience as well. I think that really predictable routine of review time because it happens every day, it gives confidence for those children who might not initially be able to um, be able to express themselves verbally um, and we use lots of visual um, prompts to support the children, photographs of what they've been doing that morning, it might be real things that they bring, a model that they've made um, and they're the experts because they're the ones who've been doing that learning in the morning and it really supports those children who may feel a little bit more shy in a group or just not might not yet have the vocabulary or they might be learning it in a, in a new language from their home language. A really great way of introducing children to new words and vocabulary is using really great books and songs and rhymes. Um, do you have any experience of, of using great things in your nursery school? Um, we use songs and stories really regularly with the children as we do all the way through um, the nursery. Um, that repetition really supports the children to consolidate their learning and gives them that sense of understanding and feeling part of the group. Um, with the two-year-olds particularly, lots of the action rhymes and nursery rhymes which have actions that go with them that you can use your whole body to explore um, really support children to sort of understand the different parts of the word um, and to really tune into the sounds within the words um, as well as, as that sense of joy of using your voice to express yourself and using your whole body to, to express yourself. The best thing of all is enjoying conversation with children and encouraging children to talk to each other. If a child knows you like talking and listening to them, 
they will want to talk and listen to you. Children will learn so much language in their earliest years and this unlocks new learning in all areas of their life. Exploring language with young learners is so important and as practitioners we're in a very powerful position to make a big difference by providing a rich language environment. Play is often the best way for children to use and explore the words that they're learning in meaningful contexts. So lots of conversation at the moment on the early adopters group about phonics and that of course is appropriate because again the evidence is really clear that if we want all of our children to learn to read especially children from disadvantaged backgrounds who traditionally have struggled more uh, with the uh, with learning to read if we want that to happen phonics is the approach we should be using the research is really clear but in addition to that, we need to think about children's language development more widely, as well as thinking about that love of reading. And those children who come into reception and may not have had many of those earlier language experiences, may have missed out on a lot of their nursery year, for example, they're going to need a lot of those sorts of experiences that I talked about in that video. We need to keep focusing on children's spoken language and communication, as well as that appropriate focus on early literacy. Because we want all of our children to get that brighter start. We might want that, but what does recent history tell us? Over the period from 2013 up to 2019, the last time that data was collected on the earliest foundation stage profile, the 4.6 disadvantage gap between children eligible for free school meals and all was steady. We didn't make any progress at all in closing that gap. And that gap is true in schools judged outstanding by Ofsted, just as much as it's in schools with a poorer judgment than that. It's a problem across the whole of the early years sector. And it doesn't just affect on average children who are eligible for free school meals. And I know that at child level, there's a lot of diversity and lots of children who get free school meals also do really well in EYFS. But let's also look at some of the other groups of children, Black Caribbean children, Pakistani heritage children, children of Gypsy Roma backgrounds. The gaps between those children and all other children are huge. And we might think that that's okay by the end of the EYFS because they have the whole of primary to catch up. But in fact, the evidence tells us that gaps at the end of the early years on average double by the end of primary, double again by the end of secondary. So early years is where the action is at to improve equality, to improve children's life chances. And when we look at the early years toolkit from the Education Endowment Foundation, we can see that an approach that focuses on communication and language and is implemented well can have a six month learning boost for the children involved. So that is enough for us to overcome that gap between disadvantaged children and all others. And again, focusing on the evidence, high quality early years is good for all of our children, but it's especially good for children from disadvantaged backgrounds. And we know now that we've got an intervention, Nelly, Nuffield Early Language Intervention, which can support those children who've fallen behind in their language in the reception year. So we've got everything we need at our fingertips to make these improvements that are so important for our children in the early years. Let's just uh, have a brief overview of development matters and think about some of the ways that that is different to the predecessor document. It is explicitly described as curriculum guidance. Why curriculum? Because again, the evidence about early learning tells us clearly that it's important that we think hard about our early years curriculum. What are the things that we want our children to experience, know, be able to do. And that is going to be different in different parts of the country. So a reception curriculum in Newham, East London, where I'm based, is not going to be the same as a reception curriculum 
somewhere else. But whatever area we're in, that curriculum needs to be ambitious and it needs to focus on secure learning. We need to ensure that we live up to that phrase, the foundation stage. We give children those secure foundations in their early learning. Because if we think about maths, for example, if children don't leave us with secure understanding of counting and number and part, part, whole relationships and doing simple operations with number, if that learning isn't secure, we get what is called cumulative disfluency, which is that teachers later on in the school are trying to build children's understanding of maths, but the foundation isn't secure. And that's why children fall further and further behind. It's really important that we're all carefully thinking about those educational programs that are in the EYFS statutory framework, but also importantly, included in development matters so that we get those foundations right. And then assessment should be geared to that curriculum. It's about checking what children have learned. It's about improving learning for all children. Development matters is not a curriculum, sorry, it is not an assessment tick list. It's deliberately been designed to make it difficult to use it like that. The intention is that it gives us the guidance on the curriculum we should be planning for our children. So we get that right, so it's ambitious. And you'll see that at the heart of Development Matters and the heart of the EYFS statutory framework, there's still that focus on play and children's self-chosen learning. But let's just think about that in a careful way. I think this book, The Intentional Teacher, Anne Epstein, is really useful. And Anne Epstein talks about intentional teachers acting with knowledge and purpose to ensure that young children acquire the knowledge and skills, the curriculum content, they need to succeed in school and in life. Intentional teaching doesn't happen by chance. It is planful, thoughtful, purposeful. Intentional teachers use their knowledge judgment and expertise to organize learning experiences for children. When an unplanned situation arises, as it always does, they recognize a teaching opportunity and take advantage of it too. This is the really important part of this paragraph to me. Intentional teaching means teachers act with specific outcomes or goals in mind for all domains of children's development and learning, academic domains, literacy, mathematics, science, what the Americans call social studies, as well as what have traditionally been considered early learning domains, social and emotional, et cetera. Intentional teachers integrate and promote meaningful learning in all domains. So when we're thinking about that important exploration and play-based learning for children in the early years, particularly for the older children, that intentional um, guidance by the teacher, mindfulness of the learning outcomes of the children is essential if the practice is going to be high quality. If all of our children are going to learn those foundational concepts and skills that they need to have secure before they move into key stage one. The second really important emphasis in the changes is that focus on workload. And lots of us would have been really um, influenced by the Early Years Alliance report Minds Matter, which told a bleak tale of the impact of excessive workload on teachers. So the changes to, de to development matters, making it shorter, putting more emphasis uh, on teacher professional judgment, taking the emphasis away from tracking and generating huge amounts of assessment data, those are educationally important intentions, but they're also intended to reduce workload. And again, one of the really heartening bits of feedback from the early adopter year on this group was how leaders in EYFS settings and school EY leads had reduced the workload around tracking and assessment, taking advantage of the reforms. 
So the focus is on curriculum with assessment that's fit for purpose, not generating evidence and assessment data for its own sake. It's a different emphasis. So if we think about the example of maths, for example, Clements and Sarama, who are the leading American researchers looking at early as maths, talk about the importance of young children's spontaneous play, which is mathematical, and that we can build on these experiences. But they also comment that teachable moments alone aren't adequate. We can't see opportunities for multiple children to build multiple concepts consistently over the year. We need to have a plan to make sure that all of our children are learning the early maths they need every day. Can't just be built on the children's play and exploration. And that's why Development Matters carefully splits up the different concepts that children need to have secure in order to be able to count up to five. And using this curriculum focus, our job isn't to tick that off quickly and move children up to the next band. It is to check that children really have plenty of rich experiences to practice, repeat, repeat, practice, enjoy, so that that learning is secure. That's what we mean by having a focus on curriculum. Um, Scarborough's reading rope, a lot of people like the way that that splits up some of the skills and concepts that children need to learn individually and be secure and fluent and automatic in. And when that's happened, those can weave together into the performance of skilled reading. You need all of those different things, automatic, fluent, so you can become a skilled reader. The Scottish Highlands Council, I think, have done a really nice job to show how children need to be secure in lots of their early physical skills before we start to teach them handwriting. So let's think about curriculum, all of those small, secure steps of learning that children need to have in place in order to move on to the next step. The EEF guidance preparing for literacy reminds us that we must get the process of handwriting right for our children so that children are forming their letters correctly and we're not just focusing on how the letters look. And the National Handwriting Association tell us that when there is considerable pressure on practitioners to get children writing, whether or not they're developmentally ready, a casualty is that children don't learn and practice the movements for each letter family. They enter year one with letters incorrectly formed. But when they talk about children not being ready, they don't mean that we just hang around and wait for them to be ready. They mean we go back and think about, for example, that work that the Highlands Council has done and think about the intensive support for children so that when we are teaching them handwriting, They've got all of the skills and the concepts they need securely in place so they can learn quickly and fluently to form letters correctly. OK, so I'm into my last couple of minutes. I'm going to try and zip through these last slides. Here's an example of our approach to curriculum here. So we've decided to use some terminology uh, around milestones and components. And the component uh, in this curriculum goal of following a recipe to bake a bread roll is clearly set state there, mix two substances together using tools. That's our assessment point. That's what assessment geared to curriculum means to us, that there are some specific things we want to check children can do, that children know, that they can fill a measure accurately to the top. So, that is an important way that we've set out our curriculum and aligned our assessment system to it. You'll also see at the bottom there, the tier two vocabulary, the words that aren't every day for children that are important as they learn to bake a bread roll. Words like predict, precise, accurate, instructions, sequence. 
these are all really rich words which we're offering to children. We're using them naturally and every day as children are learning to bake, as they're cooking. We're not hammering this vocab home, but we're making sure children hear it and use it regularly because those aren't words that you would necessarily hear every day as a small child. I'm going to end here with a very brief uh, thought about curriculum progress maps, which has been such a big focus of discussion on the group. And here are my thoughts, which I'll give you as straightforwardly as I can. We're all responsible for children from when they start with us. So if I were a primary school head teacher, I would feel responsible, I would be responsible for the children's learning from the day they started with me to the day they ended. So we need a curriculum plan from early years onwards, what's sometimes called vertical integration. I don't think that it's a good idea to take some sort of prescribed format or approach to that. And I know that neither DfE nor Ofsted are calling for that. But the fact that there isn't a prescribed format doesn't mean it doesn't matter. It just means it's up to schools. It's up to settings to use the approach that will work with them. And I've seen some stuff on the, on the group about geography, for example. You know, let's be really clear. We don't have geography as a subject in early years. We do need our geography leads in schools to understand early years. And we need our early years leads to understand the geography curriculum in key stage one and two and think together, what is the key foundational content that children will learn in early years that will support them when they start to learn geography in key stage one? And the way you set that out and articulate it, that's down to your school. But I don't think a school can do its best for its children unless it does that. Thank you so much for that slot. Ben and the early adopters admin team and everyone else. And I'm going to hand over back to Ben now uh, and stop sharing my screen. OK, so thank you very much. Um, so I think we're just going to head over to Wendy and Jill now straight away. So I'll share the screen. Thank you. Hello, thank you. You know, Julian, I so love listening to you. Um, and when you when you um, shared those milestones uh, that you're you're doing with your children, um, it, it just brought to mind um, inspecting uh, a school recently, um, where a child told told me that they were learning their destructions, um, and what they meant was instructions, but they were using the language which was just so so good. And like like you, Julian, I want to say put out a huge thank you to um, everyone that's uh, listening to this webinar and watching the webinar um, for the work that you're doing, for the, the way that you are um, real advocates for the importance of early years. And, and the great thing about uh, the new EYFS is it has put a new focus on the importance of early years and the slides you shared. I think anyone would think that we've we've got the same slides because uh, our messages, I think, are very similar. So, Wendy, I'm going to hand over to you to start our presentation. And then I know that we're going to pass the baton between us as we go on. We are, Jill. Thank you. OK, so, Ben, can you go to the next slide, please? So we just wanted to start by saying, have you seen this? So. This is our um, new page that you can find from our handbook page on .gov.uk. And you'll know we're asked, often asked lots of questions and rumours grow about what Ofsted might want to see when they're on inspection. And we set out in our handbook everything you, that you must provide on inspection and what you might want to provide on inspection. And in, in addition to this new page, linked from the handbook page, we wanted to answer some of your questions about EIF inspections and the new EYFS. And we've answered the most frequently asked of those questions here. And it's really to help schools, early years providers, practitioners, inspectors, local authorities, 
um, to be able to find out what they need to know about our inspections and EYFS. And the sectors helped us with this, as well as um, colleagues at DfE have also supported the development so that we're clear about the answers here and that they're easy to read and that you can go to this page just to check um, whether that, you know, I've heard this rumour. Is that right? Go here and have a look. OK, next slide, please. OK. Jill, so just a reminder about our EIF judgments. Yeah, so um, a reminder that um, inspectors use the school inspection handbook for early years when early years is part of a school. And as uh, this is the early adopter Facebook page, I am assuming for this presentation that we're doing, Wendy, that we're talking to our school, school people, school colleagues. So just a reminder that there are four judgments in the Section 5 framework um, and quality of education, which is essentially the curriculum and all the subjects within the curriculum. And important to say that when we're judging the quality of education, what we're looking for are not individual subject judgments. So we're not making a judgment on geography. We're not making a judgment on PE. What we're looking for are the elements within the curriculum and perhaps within PE and geography that are systemic, either systemic in a good way. So things that you're doing um, that are providing real, um, really good curriculum journeys for children, or things that are systemic in a more negative way, where some of the, the barriers are in place for children's progress. So we're going to focus a bit more on that later on. But also important to give a reminder that there are other judgments as well as the quality of education. Personal development is a judgment. That is how we um, teach children to behave to you know the, the bit about manners the bit about communication social skills all those come under the personal development judgment and in EYFS you sort of get a double hit of that because of course we've got PSED as a um, foundation knowledge within primary of learning within the curriculum so that comes under quality of education and um, personal development. And of course, the behaviour and attitudes is, is how children um, apply themselves to learning, their behaviour towards each other, towards adults in and around the school. And then, of course, leadership and management, how the whole thing fits together. And Julian, I was so pleased to hear you say about what you think you would want to do if you were a primary head teacher, because I come from... Um, primary headship myself, though, albeit a few years ago. In fact, I was just thinking that I left headship at the start of the EYFS. And what we were doing as a primary school was thinking about the curriculum that children needed to learn from when they started in our school to when they finished in our school at year six. So essentially, that that's what a school is about. The, the, the beginning of school for, for children is the point at which they join the school. So Wendy, over to you next. Thank you. So we just thought it was um, a good opportunity to remind you of um, the original case for change for EIF. And it was back in September 2019 that we introduced um, the education inspection framework. And we were inspecting for six months, I think it was, before um, inspections were paused um, for reasons we all know. Um, and our new inspection framework moved away from that focus on data and outcomes in favour of a focus on the curriculum and what children know, can do and understand. And schools in England have made real improvements over the past two decades. However, an accountability system that is over dependent on performance data is a barrier to further improvement. And there's ample evidence of the extent to which the accountability system has diverted schools from that real substance of education. The focus on data across the system means that what young people learn too often is coming second to the delivery of performance table data. And 
because far too much time, work and energy is spent on preparing everything that Ofsted might possibly want to see. And our new framework and the new EYFS has actually adjusted that focus and made it clear around those workload issues um, and, you know, to make sure that those workload issues are no longer there and we think about those really carefully. Okay. Next slide, please. So, Jill. okay, just a reminder here about uh, what that curriculum uh, journey is in for early years. So, of course, the EYFS is the statutory framework. The EYFS has within it educational programmes, the seven areas of learning, and those are statutory for, for um, all children uh, in the early years. Uh, it's up to leaders and practitioners to decide, however, how to implement those seven areas of learning and to to judge the impact of what they're doing by, by essentially checking what children know and can do. Um, so one of the questions that came through to us on this Facebook page was about uh, development matters and, you know, do, do Ofsted inspectors look at how uh, the, um, how, how the school uh, forms its curriculum against development matters and the simple answer to that is no we don't the expectation from Ofsted is that it is the EYFS curriculum that will be uh, delivered so if we move to the next slide okay. we thought it'd be helpful didn't we Wendy to go through some of the questions in this hmm. document and yes. then to tackle some of the questions that you asked us via the Facebook page. So, um, so let's do the next one. Am I going to be the question? You master? can be the questioner. Yes. Okay, yes. I like yes. that role. I like to ask you the questions, Jill. Okay, so will Ofsted expect to see curriculum maps for every area of learning in the early years? Right, and the simple answer to that is no. Um, and just as Julia, Julian gave an excellent example uh, in his presentation of how, as a nursery, they've thought about their curriculum. What Ofsted will expect is that schools are clear about what they want children to learn in the early years, because we know that it's such a vital stage of, of their development. And so inspectors will want to understand how the school designs their curriculum, to give children the foundational knowledge that they'll need for later up in the school. Um, so our inspection handbooks for both um, for registered provision and for schools, but um, in particular for schools, uh, make it clear that we don't expect to see planning in any particular way. When we're on inspection, it's about a conversation with school leaders, a conversation with class teachers, observation of the children at work, at play, whatever it is that, that they're doing, and then a clear understanding of what's working and what isn't working by uh, the curriculum leaders. And that in a primary school may be the EYFS lead, or it may be in a very small primary school, the head teacher and um, the the teacher of the, the younger children. It really depends how the school is uh, formed. So um, no, we don't expect to see a curriculum map in any uh, specific form is the clear answer on that. Thank you, Jill. And just before we move on to the next one, I think the other thing that is um, important to say as well is, is, is just building on what Julian was just saying in his last slide around geography and those questions around geography. And um, we know, don't we, that the curriculum in a primary school starts when children first join the early years, be that whether that's in the nursery class or in the reception class. And what inspectors will want to find out and understand is how the curriculum in an early years is the foundation for key stage one, as you say, for what comes le on later and how that builds in a sequence yeah. um, from nursery through to year six. Mm -hmm. 
absolutely vital that in thinking about that, we're thinking about vocabulary and language. Mm -hmm. We're not thinking about written expectations. We're not expecting to see a geography book where children have written things in, in reception, which I, I hear some horror stories about uh, some of the um, perhaps expectations that, that are misplaced. And we're get, I'm going to tackle that later on in the mm. presentation. So we'll, we'll crack on, Wendy. OK, lovely. So next, next question then. OK, so will Ofsted expect providers to show the progress of a child tracked against the revised non-statutory guidance development matters? And I'm hoping everybody who was listening knows the answer to this already. But I'll the let answer, you... I'm, yes, I'm not nodding my head. It's, it's, a, it's a shaking of my head because the answer is definitely not. Um, Ofsted inspectors will not be looking at any progress data whatsoever. And also, Development Matters has not been written to be a tick list of activities. It's been written in such a way that it gives curriculum guidance. And it's that curriculum guidance, that thread, that golden thread of what it is children need to learn that, that's so important. And the progress of that golden thread is a, de will depend very much on what the child has learned you know you can't you can't um do certain things without learning the prerequisites and I'll, I'll come on to that um in the next slide the next slide is a sort of extension of this answer wendy if we can move on yep. yeah because i think it is important to think about how inspectors will consider progress so when we're thinking about the curriculum as the progression model, you know, what children need to learn and how they're going to go about learning it, in the early years, it, defining what that progress looks like, and as Julian showed in his example, he was, he was showing an end goal of um, making a, a bread roll and the sort of stages that that went into making that bread roll, um, the progress children make through the curriculum will be in how far they're able to, to do and, and talk about uh, that, that part of their curriculum journey. And you know, so in the early years, we've got the, the, the seven areas of learning. And within those seven areas, you will be defining for your children things that you want them to learn. And, you know, Julian mentioned the uh, being able to have a, a spoonful and what a spoonful means. Well, actually, we could say that fits in the area of learning for science. It fits in the area of learning for maths. It probably fits physical in development, physical development, all sorts of things. And that's that's one of the difficulties when you're trying to explain your curriculum. But it's really important to think about it as the progression model. And when we're talking about the inspection, um, what we're what we're doing is asking um, asking schools what they are teaching and why they are cho cho choosing to teach that thing. And one of our expressions is, why are you doing this? And why are you doing this now? How does it fit in to the, the larger curriculum? So if we go on to the next slide, because that, um, that's to explain some of the language. And I've decided for this slide not to um, use an early years example, but to, do, to use an example that, that picks up on some of the language that I know was, um, there was some Twitter uh, conversation about the use of composite and components. And, you know, do we have to explain our curriculum in terms of composite and components? And, and absolutely not. You don't have to use those words at all. All those words were for were to explain to um, inspectors uh, why, why um, assessing high level outcomes didn't actually necessarily lead you to what it was that children could do or can't do. So if we think about a marathon, you know, running the, is it 26 miles in a marathon? Mm -hmm. it's, it's I, haven't, I haven't run a marathon. It's, 
it's over 20. I know um, I've never run one either, but I would, you know, but if you are training to run a marathon, you don't practice for running a marathon by running a marathon every day. You practice running a marathon by breaking it down into smaller chunks or components. So they're bits of component uh, knowledge that you need to be successful at running a, a marathon. So you can see from this diagram that you need to know about nutrition, you need to have mental strength, you need to be able to know how to stretch your body so that when you stop you don't totally seize up like I do if I've been dancing or something. Um, so all these elements are components. Another, another word for component will just be chunks of knowledge. I mean, if I'm thinking about singing a song, I'll think of chunking the knowledge that you need in order to be able to perform the song. Performing the song would be the composite, the composite performance. But to be able to perform the song, you need to learn to do lots of things. So you need to be able to uh, remember the words. You need to learn the tune. You need to perhaps put some um, expression in it in terms of loud parts and, and quieter parts. You need to uh, be able to vary uh, your tone. All sorts of components or, or bits of knowledge um, that that you need in order to have the performance. And I suppose this links back to the data uh, conversation we were having. Why is it that um, we don't look at uh, data? Why is it that data doesn't tell us the story? It's because it only gives us the performance, the composite of, of what a child has achieved. And it doesn't give us the journey that's necessary doesn't tell us about the journey a child has made in order to be able to to learn to do something or to remember something um, and that's that journey is absolutely key to success and it's where you've got bits of that journey missing where children have missed out on something so for example at the moment um, due to covid many children have missed out on conversation well that's a critical element that needs to be there in order for them to succeed in uh, being able to read, being able to write, being able to understand instructions. And so that has to be built into the curriculum and some thought about the sort of language children need to develop, the sort of vocabulary that needs to be there in terms of curriculum planning as well. But how you write that down, how you, how you demonstrate that is really um, up to you and we see many many different ways of doing that um, and we I honestly on um, from my inspection experience can't say that one way is much better than another way because if it belongs to the school and you understand it and you're you're evaluating it then the chances are that's that's working for you and it, but it won't necessarily work for a school that doesn't understand the thinking that's gone into developing your curriculum. I think another example, Jill, is quite a good one, is, is where I've come across where, where you know, um, in, in the nursery for the younger children, you know, actually, at the moment, we're working on and making sure that our children, before they, they move on, they're able to do various things independently, put their own coat on, in, you know, independently, and the various things that they do to get a child to that point. And actually, you know, as an inspector, then, we see evidence of that through seeing children putting their coats on before they go out to play. Yeah. And I suppose you see the early learning goals, Wendy, have been designed as such to say, I mean, they're a goal, they're the end point. But if you were to ask what is needed for uh, achieving um, the, 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 the uh, literacy early learning goals or the um, physical development early learning goals, what is needed for a child to get that goal? And you think about that uh, progression, the curriculum as the progression model, then your thinking is going to lead you into being able to design a curriculum that is effective. You could, for marathon, you could put anything in there, you know, what is, what is needed to learn a song? What is needed to remember a rhyme? So, so therefore, Jill, then, learning the curriculum is making progress That's and the curriculum sequences the knowledge children need. Absolutely. And just to just to uh, re-emphasize the point in the next slide, 
we've got something on descriptors and mark schemes, I think. Uh -huh. yeah. And this is to say that actually those high level outcomes, so the marathon is, is your high level outcome, it doesn't define the subject progression. And in order to design a curriculum, you need to work out the subject pro progression. You need, you need to know what that development in, in early years terms, that child development, those stages of development are. Um, so the summative grade descriptors and all that internal data that was causing such um, problems in terms of workload are, are not useful in terms of a curriculum. They're not a substitute. No. No. And if you're looking at those high level goals, say for the early learning goals, for example, you're in danger of hitting the target, but missing that point. And that whole thing, because a child's education and the requirements of the EYFS, those educational programs and the national curriculum come to that are far broader than the contents of any assessment. Yeah. And the, and the, the thing is, you do need as a teacher to assess what children have learned, what they know have they learned what you intended them to learn? You know, have they actually, uh, are they able to make up the number five from, from lots of different ways? Is that automatic? You know, is that is that really embedded? Are they secure? If they are, that's great. And then you can move them on to the next stage. But if they're not, then they need far more practice. And Absolutely, and repetition. <laughs> Yeah. And that doesn't mean to say you've got to sit at a desk and practice at a desk. It just means you've got to do things again and again and again, like using scissors. You know, you have to mm. practice that in order to to learn the skill. If I could just jump in. Uh, sorry. Um, we've just had a question come in. Said, would the composites be the ELGs and then work down the components uh, on how they get there throughout the year? Uh <laughs> Well, I think the ELGs would be far too broad to be a composite. A composite is, I mean, they could be in some instances, but in other instances, they wouldn't. Composite and components are just words that we've used to, to explain a high level outcome. Um, as in, Break it down into the small bits. And breaking it down into smaller parts. So, for example being able to um, write a word like cat would be a composite task at one level um, and the components of that would be being able to sound it out, form your letters correctly, write it, recognize it, read it, etc. So that would be a small composite. Um, depend it's all dependent on what you want children to achieve so the composite is the end goal of what you're teaching I suppose does that explain it I think so Jill okay. thank you should we should we move on to the next slide yes, yes. so this okay is... so I've got another question for you then Jill great good <laughs> So when carrying out deep dives, because we know that's the inspection methodology within the school inspection, will inspectors want to see national curriculum subjects rather than EYFS areas for learning being taught in reception? No. Uh, inspectors will expect to see in reception and in nursery, in early years in schools, they will expect to see the areas of learning as set out in the EYFS. However, and this is, I think, where it gets a bit confusing, the EYFS is the foundation stage for what comes next. And so there is foundational knowledge. And just to use um, the example of geography uh, that Julian introduced, um, there will be foundational language that is geographical language, positioning language that you would introduce within um, the, the EYFS, both in the communication and language um, uh, areas of learning and in the you know, knowledge and understanding of the world, you know, positional language, um, the knowledge that, that there's such things as land and rivers and sea and, you know, things that will help their geographic geographical understanding 
later on, you know, a bit about the built environment, a bit about the natural environment. All those things are in the EYFS and their foundational knowledge. And I think that goes back again to Julian's point, doesn't it? So it's about, you know, in a school, the you know, your, your, your subject lead for geography, knowing what comes happens in the early years and vice versa. Absolutely. Yes. OK, let's move on to the next slide. OK. Thanks, Ben. So does Ofsted expect the national curriculum? Oh, no, have we done that one? Yeah. Does Ofsted... I think we've covered this, haven't we? Does Ofsted expect the national curriculum in a primary school to start when children first join in the early years? No, no. We've, I think we've covered that. We expect yep. the EYFS, but it's foundational knowledge. And there should be a conversation between the geography lead and the EYFS lead. You know, EYFS covers everything. So, you know, there's... It, it is, there is no doubt that EYFS leads are the busiest people in primary schools. You know, I, I, reception teachers, in my view, have always uh, had one of the most tricky jobs to do. Really important because they set the tone for the rest of the school. Get children off to a good start. Let's move on to the next slide. OK, and, and this, well, I've just put this in because I wanted to emphasise the importance of vocabulary within the new EYFS. EYFS. And I think we forget about talking with children at our peril. I think a lot of the problems we get later on in the school system is because we haven't focused uh, enough on getting children to actually talk. Agreed. And I think I think, Jill, that the Literacy Trust um, research um, that came out not that long ago, that actually, you know, children with poor communication and language age five, six times less likely to do well in English age 11. And they're twice as likely to be unemployed by the time they're 34. Yes. Stark absolutely. findings. Yes, indeed. And why did I put this slide in before I put the next slide in is my question to you, Wendy. So we'll go to the next slide. OK. So what do, well, you're asking me a question before I ask you this I one. Said, why did I put the vocabulary and talk about to, it before phonics? To emphasise the importance of communication, language and talk, the love of reading, which is in the, for our youngest children, that is about, um, you know, nursery rhymes, that conversation, listening to children, talking with children, um, reading stories, etc, etc. That's all so important before we get into what do Ofsted look at when they are inspecting phonics and when does that start? Absolutely. And Julian showed a, a great video there that, um, you know, I would fully support uh, that. In fact, I wouldn't mind borrowing that video, Julian, for inspector training for our next uh, little um, bit of training that we do for them. But at the heart of everything that we do in terms of looking at early reading, vocabulary and language development is there. But of course, we are saying it's phonics is the way to learn to read. And phonics is something that you have to be taught because it, it isn't, um, you know, that it, it isn't something you, you necessarily will just pick up, though, though some children do. So what do inspectors look at when inspecting phonics? And I'm going to go on to the next slide to help with this. In every inspection of a primary school or infant school, there will be what we call an early reading deep dive. And you will find that deep dive in the um, EIF school inspection handbook. You'll find what we look at um, in paragraph 344. And I've put out the put the things there because it's about reaching an evaluation against the quality of education judgment. Inspectors will consider the following. So whether the schools determine that every pupil will learn to read regardless of backgrounds, because that is key to their futures. And then you'll see that the very second bullet here is about stories, poems, rhymes, nonfiction, what, what's been chosen, 
and why. Really important that that is before we go on to the teaching of phonics, which is on the next slide. So if we move to the next slide, so we, we talk about the phonics curriculum, we talk about reading books, we'll talk about um, the when it starts to be taught. So what we're saying there is the teaching of phonics needs to start at the beginning of reception. Um, and lots of people ask, what do you mean by the beginning? Do you mean on day one? Well, no, we mean when once you've got the children in and settled, because clearly on day one, you're settling them into school. You know, we've, we've, we've taught in reception ourselves. So we know that, that you have to get the children used to routines, used to expectations and, and you know, introducing phonics as soon as you are ready to, to get it off to a good start is important. And then um, ensuring that children keep up with the programme and most importantly, that schools have sufficient expertise in the teaching of phonics because it's not easy to teach. You know, it takes a lot of learning to be really proficient at teaching phonics because You've got to excite the children in, in terms of phonics. The, the learning of phonics itself is really important. Um, so the next slide just shows those paragraphs broken down into um, a simple criteria. So we're looking at whether the school prioritizes reading. And we start that with the youngest children in school. So in nursery, you know, what are the books that you're reading aloud to children and sharing with children? Why have you chosen those books? You know, they, they, those are the sorts of questions we ask. Why those and nursery it, rhymes? Why those nursery rhymes, indeed. Um, how do you engender in the children a love of reading? Well, reading aloud to the children in a way that makes hooks them into stories and poems and rhymes. And, you know, there were lovely examples about using actions and your whole body and, you know, really, really going for it as a teacher with children so that you engage them. So those are really key. Then knowing the programme and the progress that children make, the books matching sounds. I have to say in reception, seeing far, far better practice about using books that children, they've been taught the sound and then they have a book that practices the sound. We start from the, from the start, phonics from the start, catching up quickly for those that, that fall behind and then expert teachers in early reading. That's what inspectors are looking at in schools throughout the primary school when they are inspecting early reading and phonics. And that does start with a conversation with the teachers of the youngest children. Um, but uh, but it, it's not asking for anything that you wouldn't be valuing in, in the first place in terms of you know, the, the curriculum journey for teaching children to read. So I thought it was also important because one of the things I think we struggle with, and Julian used that in his example of intentional te teaching. I thought that was an excellent um, reminder of teacher time is precious. So how you use it and what you use it for is really precious. And so I wanted to just move on to talk a bit about writing and the writing a story independently and to look at some component knowledge. So for this, my composite task here is being able to write a story independently. Now, when we're on inspection, we see an awful lot of the very youngest children sitting with a teacher for, for a session or two sessions a week on creative writing, which is essentially writing a story independently. And I sometimes wonder why so much time is spent on the writing of that story rather than the oral uh, work that needs to come first. And this links back into do we spend enough time getting children to talk, the oral composition. So before we can write that story, writing, as in writing, we need to have two components key components. That is, we need to be able to transcribe, 
write letters, so the pen grip, pencil grip, letter formation, spelling, at least one way of writing each phoneme, and that as long as it's sort of phonetically correct. Now that's a whole load of knowledge that children need. And then we also need the oral composition as well. So can they speak in sentences? Have they got the vocabulary they need? Do they know story language? Have they heard enough stories to be able to use story language and story structures? Now, all both those sides of that chart require an awful lot of teaching. And so when I go into a reception class and I see right at the start of reception, the creative writing session where children are being expected to hold a sentence in their heads and write it down right at the beginning. I think we haven't got enough component knowledge here for these children to, to gain success. So how you use your teacher time and what you're using it for to build up to that composite task of being able to write um, I mean, we've got a, a story here, but a, a story for, for young children might just be one or two sentences. sentences. So, you know, I'm not talking, I'm not talking um, novel book or novel. <laughs> no. um, but, you know, I think really defining the components of what's needed to write successfully is is very, very important. And I think one of the reasons that we're not spending enough time on oral language, oral composition, is because we haven't really focused our curriculum on the things that are needed to get to that stage. And we're introducing it too soon, um, far too soon, in my view. So uh, just as a summary, which is our next slide, let's think about what the components we need for phonics for word reading, what do we need to be able to do? What do we need to be able to do? You know, if we think about what do we need to be able to do to run a marathon, what do we need to be able to do to read words? What in phonics do we need to be able to do? What do we need to be able to do to spell? What do we need to be able to do for oral comprehension, to be able to understand what people are saying to us, to be able to, you know, most importantly, to uh, avoid conflict because we've got enough words to avoid it. And, you know, if you look at the study of um, youth justice and their, their inability to express themselves because they haven't got sufficient words in their vocabulary and oral composition, what do we need to be able to do? If we ask that question, what do we need to be able to do in order to then that actually, I think, is a really good way to think about your curriculum when you're, you're presenting it. And if you can say to inspectors, well, we have thought about uh, what we need to do in order for children to achieve success in their spelling or in their oral composition, then I think, you know, you, you, you will be uh, fine in uh, conversation with Ofsted inspectors. Um, and on the next slide, Jill, you've just given people reference to the, the DfE's new reading framework as well. Absolutely. I think that's a really good read. There's a lot in there about mm. how to develop children's vocabulary before you get to read, you know, or it's part of reading because reading is just part of English. If we think about it, you know, in English, it's about spoken language, it's about written language, it's about reading, it's about spelling etc handwriting and those things that julian said so right but you know we've got to teach with intent it doesn't just happen if we let it happen that's when it's random and you know it, it, that causes a problem and i think the next slide jill just sums that up really quite beautifully in terms of if we keep if you keep clicking ben sorry there's some bullets that will come through some really important data there, isn't there? About one in four pupils leaving primary school unable to read, yeah. and two in five disadvantaged pupils leave school unable to read well. Yeah. Good readers do well at school, and poor readers do not. Yeah. And so the things that you need to do as a teacher to help children to learn to read quickly are, are vital. And that all begins with language 
oral language and comprehension, the communication and language um, area for learning in the EYFA. Early years. Yeah, absolutely. Good. And that's our last slide. We've probably gone over time. Well, no, thank you very much for that. I think that was really interesting. I think the fact that there haven't been that many questions coming in during your talk really highlights that everything you've covered um, was really useful to everyone, I think. Um, there were just a few things that uh, people were asking. Um, I hope you don't mind me asking. Which, um, one about the phonics. Um, do schools who are judged to be teaching phonics well need to buy a validated phonics scheme going forward? No, the validation of um, phonics schemes is for the writers of phonics programmes. Yeah. Um, if schools are deciding to um, develop their, their, their teaching of reading, and let's, let's be clear, phonics is about reading. So I, I get really worried when we talk about phonics as the thing, because phonics is just a, um, a component to the composite of reading, to use our language. So, you know, if you're buying a reading scheme um, and the early stages of that reading scheme are, it, you, you obviously need to be teaching phonics, then you would want to choose as a school, a scheme that has been validated rather than a scheme that hasn't. But I mean, I've been into schools where we've judged their, their uh, reading to be their early reading curriculum to be outstanding and they have developed their own reading curriculum. But the way that they've thought about it and the component knowledge, I love this now, I'm gonna keep using this phrase, the component knowledge that they've thought about that children need to learn, they're checking through their assessment that children have learnt what they're intended, uh, have intended, that, that that's what it's about. So, you know, you can buy any reading scheme off the shelf, but if you don't know that scheme and you don't know the order in which it goes and how the books work and what you need to practice with children, that's, you know, and that's the hardest bit when you're a new teacher. You know, I'll never forget my first week of teaching when suddenly I discovered that actually I didn't know enough because I didn't know the school's reading scheme and I didn't know how to sort it out with the children in my first week of teaching. Not a great start to, to a teaching career, which is probably why I was so keen that we get this really, really right. That's great, thank you. Um, another thing that I've seen a few questions about and uh, I've seen other sort of posts about, it follows on from the um, recent videos from the DfE uh, about implementing the new EYFS. And it, I think the, um, the view is that there's an overwhelming focus on reception children sitting at tables completing writing tasks. Is that something you would be looking for? I think you've already covered it earlier, um, really, but is that something you would expect near the end of reception or...? Um, or not maybe. Let's, let's be clear there are certain tasks that require children to sit at a table to do them well handwriting would be one of them you know so it's about designing your curriculum in terms of what is it that children need to learn to do to be able to and if it's to be able to write forming their letters correctly um, not back to front or upside down then in those times where you're teaching, intentional teaching children to write and their practice time, then I would argue that yes, they do need to sit at a desk so they can get good posture and they can uh, form their letters correctly. But that's, you're not gonna do that all day long, are you? You know, I mean, I've worked with four and five year olds and you know, they do not like it's not gonna happen. a long period oh, of no. <laughs> life, should they? Because physical development and, you know, energy is really important, isn't it? And, and, you know, but it is about that intent. As a teacher, you have to take charge of what it is you ultimately want children in your class to be able to do. And then you have to work out how you spend your time to help children get there, which is why I am so concerned about this writing a story or writing you know a creative writing before children can 
even um, spell the word cat and form the letters correctly. You know, I think we, we, our expectations, the horse. our expectations are sometimes not matched to the stage that children are at. And that's important. And, that, and that's about sequencing, isn't it? It's about sequencing the curriculum and, and the order in which you, you, you teach things. Why this? Why now? And that's great. And I think that answer really also feeds into some other comments I've seen about the value of play. And I think in early years, especially, that is something that is so important. So I think what you're saying reinforces that. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, a child is, you know, some children are only children and their first experience of of learning that there's someone else in the world apart from important little me is when they're in a class or a, a setting with other children and mm. learning to communicate and play and get on with those other children is mm. is really vital and a life skill. Um, and that's all part of personal development, isn't it? You know, what does the school do to ensure children have enough time to do that, both in a structured way, but also absolutely in a free way where they have to learn, um, you know, their, their own um, child led uh, ways of doing this? Yeah. And I think um, someone's just said, you know, is it that all children have to do this at the same time or a small group work? And I think again you've probably already answered that because I think what you're saying it, it depends on the children and what's right for your children. Mm-hmm. So. How do you decide what it is that your children in your particular context need to learn and the order in which to yeah. teach it? And some children, How do you, need, you know you've been successful? Some children need an awful lot more guidance than other children depending on where they've come from. I mean I, I taught for many years in um, in the back streets of Birkenhead, Wallasey and Liverpool. Um, so, you know, some, some pretty disadvantaged children came into my hands and some of the most disadvantaged needed the most guidance from me because it wasn't as if they'd come to, to uh, reception knowing nothing, quite the opposite. They'd come to reception knowing an awful lot of things that really was very unhelpful you know so um you know some of them knew very well how to push and shove their way uh, to be the front of any queue or any anything um and they they didn't have um the the sort of prerequisites that they needed in order to get on on with other children and to recognize that uh you know there was more than one way in the world of doing something Definitely. And I think we've just got one final question then just before we finish off for this evening. Um, it was just someone asking about sort of the progression from early years to national curriculum and key stage and all that. Um, and they're just asking, is it acceptable that for some of your subjects, you may not cover it in each term? So in some subjects, it may be that you only cover it maybe in the summer term and stuff. Is that acceptable that it might not be covered from day one, but you've shown in, in your planning and your sort of provision that you will come to it and stuff like that? Absolutely. I mean, you, you can't do everything from day one, can you? You know, that's, it's physically impossible and it's too big a ask. And it goes back to what I'm saying, you know, the schools that I'm going into at the moment where they've got reception children that can cannot transcribe their letters well um, and they're sitting and getting them to do a sort of 40 minute session on uh, creative writing that is unhelpful practice because they're not getting going to get better at creative writing without the component knowledge they need and they're not teaching the component knowledge they're teaching the composite so it's about deciding and you know in terms of further up the school if we're thinking let's just go out of reception for a minute and this isn't early years this is upper end of primary school children have missed bits of the curriculum because for, you know for various reasons deciding which bits are important is is one of the conversations um inspectors will have with the school so you know if you if you didn't manage to do uh the the romans in um in in history then what elements of your history curriculum that you would have taught through the Romans are you going to do in another place you know those sort of conversations but you can't possibly do it all at once and that's why 
That's why we get caught between a rock and a hard place about curriculum planning, because as a school, you have to have a plan. Mm. You might not stick to your plan, but you do need a plan. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, thank you very much to both of you and to Julian as well um, for your time today. I think the the feedback in the comments is really positive. um, And I think you've really helped answer the questions that people had and everything like that. So um, we all really, really appreciate it. For now, I think um, that is everything. But um, yeah, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye bye.